So this month I had the conversation with the one and only E.C. Sinkowski. She is an amazing woman who knows so much but has chosen to focus her, most of her attention at least, on nutrition. She is the founder of the 800 Gram Challenge and we get into that a little bit but just kind of also talk about some different mindsets around nutrition and ways that she thinks about it and dealing with clients. I, I think there's some awesome value here and I was honored to talk to her and thank her so much for hopping on and having a combo. Enjoy the conversation. If you have any questions for her uh, or me, feel free to shoot an email over and we will do our best to get that answered. So EC and I, we've actually known each other for a long time. Like, uh, what was our first interaction? Like, it would have been, it would have been like East Coast again fast or something or other. Like, wow, maybe. God, uh, your memory is good. Anywho, uh, you since then you've done a whole bunch of stuff and you actually basically dove really deep into the the world of nutrition, which is. Like when, when did you start digging into that? Cause I'm, I'm, I knew you always like enjoyed it, but when was the, like the push that direction? Like what, what motivated that? And when did you do that? You are right. It has been around for some time. I mean, my undergrad is actually in, um, biochem engineering and my first master's has a heavy genetics component. So bio stuff was always interesting. And then once I got into CrossFit, of course, with the nutrition background, it, it definitely wasn't interesting, always there. Um, really diving in, uh, was actually CrossFit. We had, for our staff, we had continuing education credits. And because I sort of had a nutrition role and I was looking at what to do for my continuing education credits under um, the accreditation standards, I actually was like, I'm gonna start this master's in nutrition, <laughs> which is I guess a little beefy to bite off, but I, I kind of went in with the point of like, hey, I can learn something and I, maybe I won't finish the degree. And of course I ended up really enjoying it and finishing the degree. And, and so that's ultimately what kind of launched me into resigning from CrossFit and then starting a full, a full time focusing on nutrition. That's awesome. And then focusing on nutrition full time, like I think it's one of those things where you can kind of go insane doing it. I mean, we've seen a few fellow friends do such a thing, but you seem to keep it so like your social media is fantastic and your presence around nutrition is fantastic. I, I, I've loved your perspective on everything and you've kind of come out with something that I don't know. It seems relatively unique. Most most diets that we see are are removal diets or limitation stuff, and yours was the flip side of that, which was like let's introduce and and like no, you have to do this versus let's take all this stuff away. Like, what what was like the first step for you into heading that direction, heading towards like we're gonna do it, like what got you to the eight hundred gram challenge versus something else? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, the general answer to that is I did have years of doing everything else. <laughs> so the beauty of me <laughs> working for CrossFit for so long and being around and interested in nutrition is I had done all the things. <laughs> right. And so I had a lot of experience kind of doing all the diets that you already mentioned. Um, what really got me down the 800 gram challenge was I was playing around with a couple different diet ideas about how do you measure quality? You know, people would always say like, I eat clean or I eat pretty well. And I'm like, okay, well, how do we really measure that? And of course, CrossFit and it's, desire to measure everything definitely had that kind of idea in my mind. Um, and I was playing with a couple different ideas actually, um, of how to do that. And it was during my master's, my last year, my master's, and, uh, I came across a study that looked at fruit and vegetable consumption relative to health, health outcomes. They said, okay, how many fruit and vegetables were these people eating? And then what happened to like heart disease risk and stroke and cancer risk and mortality risk. And of course at 800 grams, their risk for all of that went down. And so when I was reading it and I was already playing with this idea of measuring quality, I was like, that's it, you know, that's the idea. But then of course I had to like play it out. So I actually played around with it for six months, like tracking it for myself. What are the rules? Does anything count? How do you weigh it? You know, like what are the calories on this? What are the macros on this? And then before, you know, launching it to the public for lack of a better word. But yeah, I mean, that's kind of how it came to be. Nice. And then with, that's amazing. I mean, what is that study? It's uh, the author. I wish, uh, gosh, I wish I could pronounce their name. It's A U N E is the last name, but it's an international journal of epidemiology in 2017. Um, and they, you know, they were looking at it from a, they weren't like, this is, Hey, here's a new diet guys. What they were doing was like, what's the relative risk of when your diet has 
500 grams of fruits and vegetables, 600 grams of fruits and vegetables, 700, eight, and so on. Um, and so they found this 800 gram number was a, was a cutoff point. And then I, of course, from the diet perspective was like, okay, let's make this into a diet. That's really cool. That's cool. I had no idea the background of that. Like, honestly, like I've seen all the stuff that you've put out and I just, I, I've never heard that component of it, of why you ended up at, at that. I mean, one of the things that, I mean, even now, cause I still teach for CrossFit and I still teach the nutrition lecture, but one of my favorite ones is when we're going over like the, the vegetables portion of the meat, vegetables, nuts and seeds. It's always like when we're talking about adding vegetables, it's like one of the very rarely unifying things across most nutrition platforms is like people agree you should eat vegetables. It's it's like there's very few where they're like, no, nah, kick out all the vegetables. Just don't do it. Um, but almost every other like side of nutrition is, is really argued pretty heavily depending on the camps that they're in. Um, but the vegetables and uh, is one of those that is so awesome. Uh, the, the, with your, you know, your presence online and, and your depth of understanding of all the like different things that you've tried and, uh, and you know, what you're trying to push forward with the 800 gram challenge. What's the, is there anything that like, as you scroll through the Instagrams or the, the, the digital space, is there anything that like sets you off more than other things? Because, because I, I know there's a few things for me that when I see them, I'm just like, really? Like, really, that's the, the, the thing that you want to attack? Like, is there something that, for you, sends you that direction? Yes. <laughs> There's probably a few. We could spend the rest of the time on it. But the, the one I'll pick on <laughs> is um, marketing claims that I consider are really gimmicky. And, you know, I just did a post on this that was like me laughing and it was something like, you know, 70% of people are overweight or obese, 80% of people aren't eating enough fruits and vegetables. And you're going to tell me that MCT oil in my coffee is going to fix it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. That was a funny one. I read that um, one. That good. Yeah. And I think it's like, the, you know, MCT oil in the coffee, look, I've done it. It tastes delicious. Um, it's fine. But it's like this idea of like making people focus on these details when the more foundational pieces aren't in place. You know, it's like, I don't know, trying to specify a tempo back squat before anyone's ever back squatted before. It's like, I'm not worried about the tempo. We got to just start squatting. Right. And so it's this right. level of precision that's misapplied. Um, and sometimes I don't always think it's like malicious. You know, I think sometimes people think they've really found the new scientific, you know, discovery, but they just haven't taken that step back to ask themselves, is this really the messaging that people need to hear? And so I think that's what sets me off because it's just a little bit of a reality check. It's like, I just don't think this is it guys. Like, I just don't think this is super helpful. I think it's actually adding to people's confusion before they're at a level to, to really worry about MCT oil. And I think some of those benefits are overstated, but we could do this with a whole host of things, supplements, you know, meal timing, whatever. Totally. So essentially for you, it's not necessarily the, the statement that like, yeah, have your MCT oil. It's more like the, the claim of like, this is the, this is the key and this is what it does. And the focus on the new, like the very nuanced things versus the big picture. Yeah. It's like, you're going to get weight loss with this MCT oil and you're going to get mental clarity. And it's like, yeah. And could I also get that by doing something that addresses the diet more holistically? Yeah. And to a better degree. Yeah. <laughs> right, so, yeah. You know, yeah. it's like fruits and vegetables, you know, it's like people will be like, well, MCTs help with mental clarity. And I think some of that stuff's overstated, but I'm also like, I probably could do that by you just eating less sugar. And I could also simultaneously right. increase your fiber intake and vitamins and minerals. And you know, and also reduce your caloric load by why focusing on something like the 800 gram challenge. So I think that's it. It's like these ideas that people really latch on to when again, the foundation isn't in place. Yeah. Gotcha. So then speaking about foundation, when you're going to educate people on nutrition and when you're going out to like talk to people about nutrition, what's the like, what do you find is the place you start, you know, in terms of the educational process? Because I know you, you made a post the other day that I really loved, which was like, how do you go about changing someone's mind on nutrition kind of vaguely along those lines. And you're like, you, you don't like they, they, they like kind of have to come in and do it on their own or make that first step, you know, it's, um, and before you, and then, and then from there you can like help adjust or guide or whatever it may be, but you don't, you don't like change someone like that's, that's on them. What is the, what is the place that you find to be the most impactful to start the educational process for people? Yeah. Um, Great question. I mean, I don't, I wait until they want to change first of all. So I sort of cir circumnavigate all that. Like, how do I convince them they need to change because I don't want to address it then I wait until they're like, Hey, I want to clean up my diet. And I'm like, great, let's talk now where it goes from there. Um, 
I actually try to get out of explaining it. Um, I don't, I love explaining it. I mean, that's a lot of what I do is nutrition education, but I try not to explain too much. I try to first go to, what did you have for breakfast? <laughs> what did you have for breakfast? Let's talk about what you're actually eating. That's what we need to actually change. And then along the way, I can sprinkle in ideas of like, okay, this is why we're doing this. But I try to direct the question towards, hey, what are you eating? Oh, okay, you're doing a pastry and a whatever sugary drink at Starbucks. Great. Um, can we swap out, you know, the pastry for banana or add a banana or whatever it is and so start making changes there. But then once I get to having to explain things, because it always comes up, the, the principles I really like to come back to time and time again, um, and, you know, I actually have 10 principles, but the two that I, <laughs> I start off with are the ones about quality and quantity, because these are the ideas that we see recycled and ad nauseum into the hundreds, thousands of different diets out there. We're either cutting down the amount of food you eat, or we're focusing on high, higher quality foods, which which also affects your quantity. And so I just explain how like keto, intermittent fasting, 800 gram challenge, um, whatever, macros, all are doing these same ideas um, because I want people to understand these underlying processes that really are affecting their results. Gotcha. So in essence, you don't, again, you don't just, well, I guess, I guess your social platforms are you putting yourself out there to people who want to hear it, right? Uh, or, and then you wait till they come to you. So you don't say like, I'm going to sell to you. You're like, I'm a, you're going to come to me. And then when you come to me, then I'm going to, we're going to start being like, what are you doing? So that way you get a sense of where it is. And then to actually educate, you start with the first two of your 10 principles, which is the quality and quantity and just educate it on how that actually works. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, to be honest, it's really like starting them almost with the 800 gram challenge. And as they ask questions, I'm weaving in those concepts of quality and quantity, but the focus on it is on the person, what they're currently doing, how can I make changes towards quality and quantity? And then as they ask questions, kind of clear that up for them. Um, yeah, but I really try to minimize the, the explaining. Explaining certainly happens on my platforms and my courses because that's what people are going there for. But when right. you're really making changes, it's not like here are these you know, 16 studies that are going to prove you that I'm right or something like that. <laughs> right. It's more just like, let's eat some real food and let's eat 800 grams of fruits and veggies. Gotcha. Yeah, um, totally. What, what has been the biggest pushback that you got on your 800 gram challenge? Because I, the, the only things that I've ever seen are people being like, well, you, you eat too much fruit or something like that. Or like, what if you did only potatoes or like they throw out, it seems like those are the only like angry vocal oppositions that I've ever seen to what you do. Is there anything else that I'm not seeing? Yeah. I mean, there are weaknesses of it and I think it's always good. I mean, I think 800 gram challenge is a great idea, but I think it's important to kind of criticize our best ideas. And there are, there are weaknesses and limitations of it. And, and you have hit some of them, the fruit, but we all know that that's silly anyway. Um, right. But ones that are actually real are that I have had people experience weight gain on the 800 gram challenge. Um, now I actually don't think it's the fruit and vegetable consumption. I think it's because they're not limiting how much ice cream they have in addition to the 800 grams but you know it's not total totally controlling for all the quantities so it is very possible for people to gain weight and unfavorable weight doing it um so there that is an issue the other issue is you know you kind of mentioned it but it's like if i only eat potatoes like technically under the 800 gram challenge you could do it all on white potato or you could do it all on avocado um you know, I think for the most part, when people act normal, <laughs> they don't do that. But yeah, I mean, that technically fits the rules and they wouldn't be getting a really diverse array of nutrients. So that's not ideal. And then the third thing is um, there are some gastrointestinal disorders that people don't know they have. IBS is one, irritable bowel syndrome. And so they'll have these fruits and veggies and they'll have kind of more bloating, more gas, and they'll be like, oh, this isn't good for me. When it's like, hey, we need to address that underlying symptom, which you need to go to a qualified practitioner for. But people will be like, oh, fruits and veggies aren't for me. And it's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> no, they are. <laughs> fruits. <laughs> Sorry, that's funny. <laughs> but we have to like, because some people do have things like SIBO and all these other things that, yeah, right now, 800 grams might not be the right amount. But, um, you know, I don't do a ton of education on that front because that really needs to be handled with kind of individual qualified practitioners. But that is an issue there for sure. Right. That makes sense. I like it. Um, I have some like uh, selfish questions. Um, I think those are some of the best ones. And these are also from Taz as well. Um, Taz was giving me some stuff. And uh, you have this stuff like you just kind of have to make the decision to eat a certain way. Um, and I think that there's different types of people, obviously, who are going to make that decision. Right. And like so say you're I mean, 
and this is kind of along the lines now that I'm thinking about it of of how do you get this person to make that decision <laughs> but I think what would what would be the what would be the thought process you could see for somebody who's brand new to nutrition um, it has you know never even examined their their life and food like what do you think would help them under like I don't know I guess help them understand the to make or help them guide them in their decision to do this I, I guess it's not telling them to do it but it's like yeah, so the brand new nutrition is is 800 grams the first step. Like, what's the psychology around continuing to, or like starting the process for a new person? Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is definitely where I think coaches and courses are great. Like, I I sometimes think I, I worry that when I say, oh, you just have to make a different decision, and oh, you just have to be self accountable. That I'm trying to say something against coaching and courses and I'm not because I offer those services and I think they're great. <laughs> you know, there's a time and a place for coaches for sure. And especially starting out with no nutrition knowledge, that's a time. <laughs> so you get some right. direct guidance and whether or not it's a weekly check-in or it's a course or it's a Facebook group, I don't know, whatever it is. I think that's great because you do need that person to kind of bounce those ideas off of, or when they're like, Hey, I travel a lot. I don't know what to get. It's like, Hey, let's walk through an example of what you can get at the airport, you know, all of those things. So I think that's great. Like, yeah, it's make a different decision, but it has to come from an educated place. And, and maybe they do need that other person in the beginning, especially to help with that decision. Yeah. Gotcha. Well, so what about the other end of the spectrum? So someone who's, I don't know, like, elite level athlete at one point in time in their lives, uh, kind of has done many, many things, understands weighing and measuring, knows quite a bit of the nuance of food and, uh, is relatively healthy to a certain degree, but, uh, they also are having a difficult time sticking to something after long, longer than a week, you know, like they'll commit, but then they won't, won't do it. You know, just a random person, like, Let's just say like this person exists, like what's, what's the direction you take with that? Because I, again, like they're, they're coming, say they come to you and they're like, Hey, I want your help. But you know, they're having a hard time sticking to something longer than a week. Uh, what, what's, what do you do? Yeah. I Wait, mean, what have you researched the psychology there? Like what's going yeah. on? Yeah. I mean, I, I brought this up actually in relation to somebody else and it's, it's not going to be you because uh, this person, um, you know, wasn't necessarily an elite athlete, but they were a client that I turned down and it was because they found success when they were working with other coaches um, and they would have massive success with that coach. And then they stopped working with the coach and they would slide off and they would gain a significant amount of weight and then go back with a coach and see success slide off. So I actually turned them down because I said, what, what, what am I going to say or do that's any different than what you've done before? You know, you already know that I'm going to have you eat more fruits and vegetables. You already know that's going to be more protein and less, you know, pick your vice of choice. And so what I told that person is, hey, I actually think you need to spend time with a professional that's not me, somebody in the more mental health space, somebody who is kind of that behavioral change person. And nutrition coaching certainly has that set. But I think when we have somebody who's kind of this repeated cycle, you know, they've done all the courses, they've done all the things, they know all the things, and they still aren't making the changes. It's not really about nutrition at that point. Um, it's about something right. else. So that is a different client from you. From somebody like you, it's, it's you're choosing your trade-offs. You know, um, that person I would suggest might have more of like, you know, mental health to work on it. And maybe you're, maybe it's, that's the same thing for you too, but because you're in a healthier spot, I think it might be something more like, Hey, I'm healthy enough right now. And it's not a priority relative to family, business, et cetera. And we all have trade-offs that we choose in our life, you know? And so you have to decide where you're focusing your time and energy. And maybe right now it's just not up there for you. Right. I would, I would, I would agree with that. I'm actually right now doing a year of no, no alcohol, no sugar. Um, just, I, I enjoy, I found for my own psychology, I actually like really long challenges. Like even like the whole 30, I'm like a whole 28, you know, every time <laughs> or the whole, whole, whole 19, like I'm crushing it. But like, you tell me to go a year and I'm like, yeah, sure, man, let's do it. Where are um, you on your year, year then? This one was, so I did a year, no alcohol two years ago and then okay. a year, no sugar a okay. year ago. And then I took a year off and then this year I'm doing both. Yeah. Um, and, uh, I'm, you I started, started in January. Day. Oh, Mother's I started day. Mother's day. Yeah. So not, not too long ago, but it's, it's, it's not that bad for me once I like make the decision to do it. It's just like once I've, I mean, since I've been an athlete, I train, I ate so I could be better than other people physically. Right. right? 
and uh, uh, I no longer have that same desire, uh, and and I also don't need to feel like I look a certain way, you know, like I, I, I'm pretty confident in all of that. So it's like my decisions are, are really interesting around eating just because it's like, I know the good things to do. And I, I, and I also like when I take a bird's eye view of it, I like, I eat pretty well. Like I, and it's just, I definitely could stand to eat more veggies. What I found is kind of helpful for me is like, um, I'm growing a lot of them right now. We, we have a, 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 like a little mini farm and we've got all this stuff. So I find myself eating tons of fruit cause we have fruit trees year round. And I find myself eating a, a, a ton of like the vegetables I have in my little garden there, which right now are pretty much just arugula and tomatoes. Um, but it's great. Like I think that, that the effort I put into it is so much, it's so validating, you know, mm-hmm. um, and the taste, I mean, I just was talking about somebody else. They're like, oh my gosh, I had no idea that I loved arugula that much, you know? And it's like, yeah, it tastes way different when it's local and fresh and yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, I think that's the biggest difference in quality when you're buying stuff is like, is the taste. Like when you buy really fresh stuff, it just tastes amazing. People argue about the nutritional difference, but I I could not tell you the science behind that really. I just know that like it tastes way better. (laughs) Yeah. Um, the Taz was actually curious, like, what are your vices? Like when you're, when you're craving something and you're going off in your own like direction, I know for me, it's like potatoes. I, I really am like the salty savory, like, yeah, like not the worst in the world, but like, what are the things that like cause you to head away? And then what are the things you tell yourself or what do you do to come back to doing what you want to be doing? Yeah. I'm a sugar fiend. Um, I love Peeps, the Easter candy that everyone thinks really? is disgusting. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. Amazing. Peeps. Wow. I love frosting. Like, I'll just eat the frosting and leave the cake. Um, yeah. Yeah, candy corn type stuff. Like, I love sugar. Oh, I love me some candy corn. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so, yeah, I mean, I think stuff like that, um, probably bread products, if I, if I did a bunch of that stuff. Um, my big trick is I just don't keep it around the house um, or I buy it at Easter and then I'm done or I have it at the birthday party and I'm done. Like I know I love frosting. So guess what I don't buy frosting, right? Like or I know it, <laughs> you don't you know, have that jar of frosting sitting at your house. Yeah. Yeah, no, <laughs> totally. good, good call. <laughs> yeah. Main lining frosting. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I mean, I think that's just a habit that I've learned, you know, and I think that's what happens is you just kind of have to be honest with yourself. Um, the other thing is like, I'm not like, I like tortilla chips, you know, and there's some delicious brands out there like lime, whatever. I can crush a bag if I buy them. So guess what I don't buy the bag of tortilla chips. Um, and I think that's where people just have to get honest with themselves a little bit. Like if you know, you're going to like eat the sleeve of cookies from your favorite cookie brand, you just don't buy it. Right. And if it's like, well, I buy it cause of my kids and all of that stuff. I think there's probably some in-betweens that you can find that aren't like your vice that also are what your kids like. Right. There might be something that they like that you just can kind of pass by. And I think that might be a good go between um, for the people that have to have those choices. But like, for me, it's like, yeah, I just don't have it around or like alcohol, like, I, you know, I don't try not to have alcohol around because oh yeah, I'll have a glass of wine at night or yeah, I'll have the beer and instead just save it for when you're getting together with friends or stuff like that. There's a, I, there's a great book by, um, uh, Stefan Guiné and I think it's actually Stefan, but that's how you spell it. Um, and it's called the hungry brain and it's all about hunger signaling. And he's like this neurochemist PhD, like super brain guy and (laughs) great research, great, all that stuff. And at the end of the book, he's like, so I just recommend that like, you don't have it around the house. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Here's like, the gist of the book. Yeah. And, yeah. and that's what it is in the sense of all this science. Once we get back to application, it's like eat more fruits and vegetables, don't eat too much processed stuff, you know, and there's tons of underlying mechanisms for it in terms of weight gain and hunger signaling and craving. But then at the end of the day, it's like, what are these simple strategies that like help us keep stay in check, you know? So don't have it around the house and then make the decision. And then your one of your quotes that you kind of do a lot is the whole like you can't have a relationship with food. It's like food's not a person. Yeah. Like, yeah. What's your thoughts on that? Yeah. Because I mean, you're you're, you're mm-hmm. questioning it right now. <laughs> no, it's just that like I think there's all these um, 
feelings around food uh, that we don't have with other things in life like stress or if I like if I didn't sleep well last night I don't beat myself up the next morning about gosh I really didn't sleep well last night you know but if I have too many brownies I'm like oh I'm such a terrible person so there's this weird I don't know relationship that people put into their food and I think I think sometimes it's under or masking underlying um, kind of self-worth self-love issues that I think are better served by looking at those directly versus trying to start the next macros diet or get back on the 800 gram challenge or whatever it is. If you're constantly feeling like you have this relationship with food, I think they're better addressed by looking at things that are not food related. Hmm. So that kind of goes back to earlier talking to somebody who's more in the mental health space rather than the, the food space. Totally, totally. And I think in our culture, whether or not it's just because there's blending with like uh, aesthetics and so much value on how you look and all of that stuff. And that's really where the intertwinement has been. But yeah, I mean, I think a lot of times we try to solve some of those issues with a new diet and it's just like, hey, let's be real about what the issue is and let's address the issue because those are real issues. And I'm not saying that they're not, but I'm just saying we're not going to fix it by focusing on fruits and veggies, you know? Right, <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, that'd be cool. I think it'd be great if you fixed an underlying issue just by focusing on fruits and veggies. Um, totally. So, so uh, if people want to like start the basics and like meet with you or do anything along those lines, how do we, how do they find you and what's the your suggested starting place? Do they just go straight? Is there like a 400 gram challenge ramp up or is there like, like, is it just, you jump right in? What is it? Yeah. I, uh, it depends on the person. I do recommend anybody that's coming out of like the, I've done paleo, I've done whole 30, I've done zone. Yeah, they can start with 800 grams. If you're talking to the person whose standard American diet hasn't really made any diet changes yet, that's going to be like, hey, how many fruits and vegetables do you have a day? And it, and it might be none. I actually was DMing with somebody, they use the 800 gram challenge with their clients. And she's like, we actually start with um, one cup of fruit at breakfast because the rest of the diet is all just processed stuff. And so, yeah, you oh. might have to, yeah, you might have to scale it. And, and this is where I really like all those parallels of nutrition to like CrossFit coaching, because it's like, it's finding that line that is a little bit of a stretch for the person, but they also can do, right? Like, you know, if somebody comes in and they can't do a muscle up, you're not going to send them to the high rings and just be like, keep kipping. <laughs> right, right, right. You're going to be like, okay, we can do ring rows. You know, you're going to find something they can do that provides a challenge and a stimulus. And it's the same thing with nutrition. It's like, you want to push them a little bit, but you also want to meet them where they are. Awesome. And then, so for you, if people are, do you have something that gyms can like, uh, learn about and then be able to deliver to their people? Yeah, I've started an affiliate nutrition program, which essentially I see it as a way that they're, um, they can onboard their members for nutrition without doing nutrition. <laughs> so they can, send gotcha. all the, uh, they can send all of the protein shake questions to me. Um, and yeah, it's a six week course and they basically sell spots to it, to their members. And I see it as a great way they can do it in like a foundations, you know, when somebody walks through the door, but if they also have a member who's a year in and they're ready to get started on nutrition, it can work for that person too. And uh, yeah, there's a way to ask me questions directly. And that that's one way for gyms to handle it for sure. What's that called and where do we find it? Yeah, it's off of OptimizeMeNutrition.com, which is undergoing some reconstruction, but uh, it's Nutrition Essentials is the program. And, okay, I, cool. and it's kind of like, for lack of a better word, it's like level one, because then I have my Nutrition Essentials Masterclass, which is kind of the, the heavy duty, <laughs> in-depth program for people that really want to geek out on nutrition. Awesome, which is highly necessary for uh, many, many people. I've, I've known many who love that route. Um, and the other thing I just wanted to say, you kind of reminded me of it is like yours was a six week course. You didn't say challenge, which I, I appreciated, but it's like the, the like post challenge or the post attempt at something like what's the, is there any like tips and tricks for psychology beyond that? Is it like, or, or is there something that you're doing during, during a six week course where you're educating that about the lifestyle that it's like, this isn't hey, this isn't to make it through this. It's it's to, to educate you further. Because I mean, I even like the, the language difference between course and challenge that you're saying there. Yeah, I mean, I do offer challenges as well for gyms. Um, 
partially trying to move away from that, sort of for the reasons you mentioned, less though from the psychology of the individual and more for the uh, sustainability for a gym owner because a challenge happens once and then it's done. But yeah, I mean, I talk about that in my materials. Um, I, I also just... I also just think, I don't think I mind challenges as much as maybe they've taken some heat. Of course, I don't think like, you know, eat only meat for 30 days or like that, you know, assuming we're doing something that's like kind of whole food based oriented. I don't think I mind it because at some point the assistance needs to come off, you know, the band aid needs to come off and the person needs to do the work on their own. And so that's, that's, that's nutrition. And that's why I think that I do talk about sustainability and that you shouldn't just jump off at the end of 30 days and go back to, I don't know, cupcakes and brownies or whatever it is. But at some point the person needs to want to do it themselves because how else are we going to make change? They're not going to, it's like anything in life. Like they're not going to have a coach there for every single decision they make. And at some point they need to do it on their own. Right. I think for me, just challenges, I, I don't view them. I view them as like a, as an educational experience, right? So it's like, it's like a forced educational experience rather than, like uh, a forced lifestyle switch because I think a course and then like more education is in, in that area. So I like the idea personally of challenge. I know a lot of people don't like challenges because it promotes like off and on sort of deal. But it's like, I think if you build the language around them as this is like an educational experience, really pay attention. And this is a good little test time. It doesn't have to be forever. It's short. It's blah, blah, blah. It's like, and then you can like use that as the educational platform to shift their choices down the road or, or make them create a more sustainable life out of it. I don't know. I, I've liked challenges for my personal opinion. And I, I probably should uh, mention something else that I have that is kind of, that's also uh, tied in with the podcast that I launched, but um, I have this tracker, this free tracker online called the consistency project and people just say yes or no. Did they do the 800 gram challenge? Did they hit a protein target? Did they exercise and did they sleep? And it's like a leaderboard free tracker thing. And, and that actually was born out of the fact that people would finish challenges, the 800 gram challenge with their gym, or they'd finish the lazy macro challenge with their gym. And they'd say, well, now I want more accountability. And so I was like, all right, well, this is, this is something. So that's out there as well. And it's, it's really not meant to be like, I'm collecting all this data and everything to analyze everything. It's just a simple kind of mental check on the day of like, am I keeping the big picture in mind? Um, and I think something so simple like that can be enough for people, you yeah. know? It's like a lazy man's journal. It's like everything's already filled out. You just have to like do the checkbox next to it if it applies. I totally. like it. Totally. I mean, that's my kind of journal right there. Like I get to the end of the day and people are like, start to journal. I'm like, fuck this. I After don't like wanna... two days. <laughs> like, I'm so tired. Is, <laughs> the truth is we don't need to know if we had four ounces of turkey breast last Tuesday. We need to know that we ate well, right? right. And so I think that's where sometimes we get a little bit lost and like more data. It's like, no, the value is the fact that you did it, not that you have data that you did it, right? Right. <laughs> no, it's the value is having the yeah, yeah, yeah. Gotcha. Well, that kind of like, I'll have one final question for you, and then we can end this thing. Uh, the I'm someone who still gives level ones, teaches level twos, talks about a lot of stuff. I don't know if you've seen the new level two nutrition lecture, which not talks a lot really. about I've heard that there is one, but yeah, it's more about it, educating change yeah. or something. Well, yeah, it's talking more about to the psychology side of it. It's actually Mike G. Mike Mike G. wrote it, and it's talking about the the necessary things for change and and continued. Yeah, it's cool. I, I actually really enjoy it. Uh, I think it's deep. I think it's a lot deeper than um, than I think some people are ready for um, uh, on the delivery side of it because you have to have like a pretty firm understanding of the material to deliver it in a way that it can be heard and even be acted upon. So I, it's an interesting one. Uh, anyway, uh, my, my question for you is like, if you could go step back into the CrossFit space, uh, I mean, which you could probably if you wanted to, but like, and, and teach uh, these level ones and give these nutrition lectures, is there anything that you would like add or change about the delivery that like I could add or change about my delivery to emphasize certain points um, differently? Like, is there, is there something that I could say, is there something that you disagree with that we're currently putting forward? Yeah. Um, not really. I mean, I, I, you know, we could argue over semantics a little bit. Um, I think what CrossFit helped me with and has helped many people with is 
you got to look be outcome based. I mean, we can argue till the day is done about whether or not you're having enough spinach or I don't know, protein in your diet, pick your variable of choice. At the end of the day, we have to look how our markers are trending. And that's going to be your best guide. And I think that's, uh, I think that idea of, you know, um, that we have measurable data that we're looking at and we're assessing our outcome based on that is so important. Um, and it's true. It's very important in nutrition and personal experience with nutrition. And so I think that's something that is, I don't know, part of the level one kernel and I hope always stays. Yeah. I mean, it's a heavy part of the nutrition lecture and it's something I stress every time the, the systematic self-observation and, uh, the measurable, observable, repeatable results. Um, yeah, I love it. Thank you. And so where's the best place to find you? OptimizeMeNutrition.com, which is undergoing the renovations. <laughs> yeah, but you know, it's a website. People figure it out. And same handle on uh, all the social medias. Yeah, dude, find her on social medias. Anybody who's watching or listening to this, it is great. I want to thank EC so much for coming and being with me and chatting with me. Uh, if you want to reach her, you can check out OptimizeMeNutrition.com. Uh, it's up and running now. I know she was saying it was under maintenance during the podcast, but it's been a couple days. And uh, you can also just check her out on Instagram, same sort of deal, Optimize Me Nutrition. Uh, also just Google the 800 gram challenge and you'll find plenty of information on her. Fantastic conversation. Thank you so much, EC, and hope you all enjoyed.